Okay, good. All right, so now this brings us to our keynote talk. And this year it's by Jim Head, and we're going to hear about the scientific goals for human exploration destinations. Thank you, Jim, for giving this invited talk. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Yvonne, and thank you very much also for sticking through to the end here at this really great conference. One of the things I really want to try to do today is to give you a little idea about what the great scientific destinations are for human exploration and convince you that human exploration is not just that, it's huge amounts of robotic exploration as well. In fact, if we don't do it hand in hand, we're not doing our job here. Secondly, I want to convince you that science and engineering synergism, such as I learned in Apollo program, my first job, uh, is essential, and we're well on the way to that, as you can see from the deliberations that we've had uh, in the last several days. So let me first start by uh, pointing out that uh, the scientific goals for human exploration, I want to talk about each of these. There are a lot of them, but we'll go through them relatively rapidly, sort of at the, you know, the uh, Botkey 7 level, something like that we talk about. Uh, so uh, the key thing here, though, scientific goals for human exploration. We had a wonderful micro-symposium about this. Uh, in uh, just a few, uh, uh, earlier this year, and in fact, uh, the, what we found was, in fact, dedicating this to Mike Wargo, which is really, uh, I, I think, a huge, important dedication to him because it, it came together so greatly in all the kinds of things that he's worked on over the years. And what we found was, in fact, that there are huge numbers of scientific destinations and goals and objectives for human exploration. I mean, it's just a no-brainer, okay? Uh, we know what we did in Apollo, we know what humans can do, and in fact, uh, perfecting these capabilities by living in low Earth orbit for all these periods of time. We're ready to go, okay? So we saw, in fact, that uh, asteroids, a series of uh, presentations on asteroids, Clark Chapman, uh, Carol Raymond, uh, Bill Botke, et cetera, lots of really interesting things going on there. Phobos and Deimos, uh, Abby Freeman and Scott Murchie pointed out the really interesting objectives, goals and objectives there. Uh, and we learned a lot about perspectives on human exploration as well, uh, leading forward to Mars from uh, scientists there. On the second day, we actually spent a lot of time on the moon. Of course, of course, we've been there. We know what's going on. There's huge numbers of really important objectives there as well, as you heard this morning and throughout this conference. Sacha Bezileski talked about the background of uh, robotic and human exploration plans for the Soviet Union. Sergei Khrushchev, the son of Nikita Khrushchev, uh, gave us a perspective on this from uh, his father's and his point of view. He was actually a rocket scientist in Chilomeo's Design Bureau. And Carly Peters filled us in on all the great results from mineralogy of the moon. But the most important highlight, I think, was, in fact, these two people here, Dave Scott, the commander of the Apollo 15 mission, and Jack Schmidt, the uh, lunar module pilot on Apollo 17, who were both there to share their perspectives on what happened on the moon, the lead up to that, how it all got executed, what we learned, and what we should be doing in the future. That was really incredibly interesting. And I think a key point here was that we also looked to the future. And this is where the next gen comes in. OK, we'll talk about this again and again. It is so important. It's not about the next generation. It's about the next generations. We're in this for the long term. Mars is not going to happen, certainly in my generation. Okay, It's not going to happen in your generation, potentially. Hopefully it will, but you need to be planning ahead at every step of the way. So we learned huge amounts about that, and we found out that there were lots of different places to go. So let's look at human capability and robotic partnerships. I'd like to give you some lessons from Apollo. This is my first job. I was really fortunate to get right out of grad school and start working in this program. And there were some amazing things that I think tend to uh, get forgotten, or simply people like me and others are looking at a specific 15415 rock, and it's out of context. You don't put it in the context of the Apollo program. What I want to do is give you a warp 7 view, if you will, of what went on in Apollo, OK? An integrated view so that you can see how we can do it again. We've heard today about how we don't want to repeat Apollo because it was a dead end. You want to repeat Apollo, but you want to make it sustainable. OK, so let's, let's try to take a look at that and in fact look at human capability and robotic partnerships, the lessons from Apollo. Well, six lunar landings and the context was the race with the Soviet Union. Absolutely no question about that, okay? And that generated the funds and the motivation to do all this. Uh, but it was absolutely incredible. Six landings, each one more complex with increased capabilities. And for me personally, uh, I got into this because I was looking for a job right out of grad school before getting out of grad school, actually. And it turned out that I looked at the college placement annual, which most of you kids in the room won't know what this is, but it's a book, OK? It's like a book has covers, stuff like that. You open it up, and there are pages in it. <laughs> so, so the thing is, I looked in the back under the table of content, or the uh, index, 
for geology. Okay, so page 16 to 24, and then there was this page outlier, like 42. I go, well, why is it out there? I turn to that page. It was simply a full page view of the telescopic observations of the moon. And the words written on there, our job is to think our way to the moon and back. And I said, oh my god, how do you do that? I was like, you know, <laughs> I was hooked, okay. There was a little phone number down in here, you know, I called the phone, you know, called the phone number, uh, and it was at NASA headquarters looking for people to work in their systems engineering organization. I applied, much to my surprise, given that my PhD thesis was on carbonate basin evolution in the Devonian of Appalachian, having nothing at all to do with the moon, um, that I got the job. Well, of course, after several months of creeping around, not wanting to talk about what my PhD was, I realized that nobody knew anything about the moon. Mapping of the moon, Don Wilhelms, who's been here with us this week, was already at the telescope countless hours looking at the moon, trying to piece together the history, thinking about what's going on. But most people, there wasn't really a field at this point uh, to a large degree. And so it was all uh, thinking your way to the moon and back. Thinking your way to the moon and back, systems engineering. Okay. So why did we go? Well, of course, the national goal, the Apollo Lunar Exploration Program. You didn't know when you were going to get there, so you had to build multiple spacecraft. But very clever engineers and persistent scientists put together, in fact, <clears throat> a series of missions which turned into an Apollo Lunar Exploration Program from the get-go. Okay, This is critically important. We had huge numbers of robotic exploration missions, Ranger, Surveyor, Lunar Orbiter. There was landing site mapping analysis and selection studies led by the US Geological Survey, an amazing bunch of people. Very uh, perspective. They had great perspective and lots of knowledge, and that drove a lot of what we were trying to do. Close coordination, and this again, science and engineering synergism, working shoulder to shoulder from the beginning, trying to figure out how to optimize and do these kinds of things that seem really impossible. Okay? So what did we do when we got there? Well, we accomplished the national goal on Apollo 11. Okay, That's great. But we then undertook, even with Apollo 11, an historic scientific exploration program which optimized human and robotic exploration. I mean, this is really amazing. It wasn't just getting out, picking out the rocks, and so on. It was a huge integrated program, OK? ALSEP, LSC, I'll come back to these, CSM, SIM, DMLRV. I mean, the mother of acronyms all over the place. Unbelievable. I'll come to those in a minute. We sent a professional geoscientist to the moon, Apollo 17 lunar module pilot, Jack Schmidt. OK, he went to Harvard, OK? But he's really good, OK? He was really good. And uh, you know that, that's an amazing thing. Think about that. One of the first set of humans to go to the moon was, in fact, a geologist. That's incredible, OK? And he did a great job. What was the legacy? Prestige, pride, and perspective. I don't know why we've forgotten that's what the space program can do for us. You know, in the short term here, uh, I'd like to see more international leadership with the space program. But we do pretty well with the International Space Station and other things, OK? Revolutionize human understanding of Earth and planetary origin and history. OK, I mean, literally, we knew nothing about the early history of the Earth. It gave us perspective on that. Most importantly, this is our paradigm for how we interpret the other terrestrial planets. It's really you know, it's scary when you think about it, because the moon is not exactly the way it works. We have so much information, we can frame good questions and interpret other planets based on the Apollo legacy. OK, so let's talk about those precursor robotic missions. I mean, like, like there were over 20, maybe close to 30 precursor missions from an international point of view. Ranger 1 to 9, which uh, was a hard lander. Surveyor 1 to 7, soft landers. Lunar orbiter, orbiters which mapped with increasing capability uh, the surface of the moon. And this is what we used to pick the landing sites, et cetera. You have to remember, at this time, we didn't know anything about the moon. Major amounts of effort went into overcoming Professor Tommy Gold from Cornell's idea that when the astronauts landed on the moon, it was simply fairy castle dust. And the whole lunar module, let alone the astronauts, would sink 10 to 30 meters into the subsurface. You know, that's not, that's kind of like, you know, you hold the flag up as you go down. I don't know what it is, but you know, you, you just don't want to have that happen, okay? This was not trivial. We didn't know enough to know that that wasn't going to be the case. That's why all these missions uh, were absolutely necessary, precursor missions. So robotic and human exploration go hand in hand. The Soviet Union was very busy at this time. You should check this engineering out. Totally amazing, okay? I mean, this is in the 1960s and 1970s. They've got landers on the surface, two lunacides that just perform beautifully. Uh, uh, hard landers, soft landers. Uh, in fact, sample return missions in 16, 20, and 24. I mean, unbelievable. We, we can't do that right now, exactly, OK? But they did it 45 years ago. Apollo missions, Apollo 7, 1968 to Apollo 17, 1972. Look at this. I mean, we were doing these things every couple of months. It was incredible pace. Uh, but somehow, it got done, and it was extremely well integrated. 
astronaut training. All the time that we're preparing for these missions, we're taking the astronauts in the field. And I want to emphasize, we've heard some great talks about astronaut training, Jake's and uh, uh, Darlene's, etc. Really need to think about how this is going to happen in the future. And I particularly like the Hawaii one because, in fact, it emphasized a lot of the things that we felt at the time, which was key cubed, train them, trust them, and turn them loose. Okay? We knew that the valuable time on the surface of the moon is not going to be, should not be taken up by, here's a rock, what does it look like back in Houston? Uh, it's like, if they don't know what to pick up, you know, they shouldn't be going to the moon. Huge amount of training went into this so they could make the decisions and actually, everybody, you know, the more I read about the Apollo program in the last decade, I must have missed a hell of a lot because it doesn't sound like the one that I knew. Okay, so for example, oh yeah, it was all scripted. Well, you don't go to the moon. You don't go in the field without a plan, okay? But the astronauts were not scripted. They were there to have general ideas. Here's what we could find at this site, et cetera. And then they were turned loose. And they made independent decisions, made beautiful decisions on the spot, got things like the seatbelt assault, other kinds of things that never would have happened if it had been totally scripted. So it's really important. All these different things here, which I won't go over, are, are really critically important and, and went into the astronaut training. This is what we should be doing now. And we should really think about this, train them, trust them, and turn them loose, particularly when we go to Mars, where the essentially response time is prohibitive, OK? OK, so let's talk about the scientific goals and objectives. Broadly, we were to understand the nature, internal structure, and history of the moon and its environment. That sounds pretty generalized, but we didn't know anything. <laughs> Literally, we didn't know anything. Was the moon formed hot? Was it formed cold? Yuri hypothesis, we didn't know that either. We didn't know the ages of the Mari. Some people thought they were as young as a few tens of millions of years. Other people thought they were as old as four billion years or more. We just didn't have a clue, OK, because we didn't know the flux, OK? So in fact, one of the first things that we did was to wallpaper with different kinds of experiments what you could do on the moon. So we have surface science stations, deployed surface experiments package like the science ALSEP, surface exploration, lunar surface observations, photography, exploration, traverses, and sampling, the field geology, all kinds of things on the surface the astronauts did. Orbital exploration. There was an astronaut on orbit who was very, very busy throughout this time. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a second. And the moon is a platform. The moon was used as an observatory. There was an alignment alpha on Apollo 16 uh, telescope that was set up. Gravity waves on Apollo 17 uh, were attempted to be detected in experiments like this. So the moon was used as a platform as well. And then there were fundamental questions that evolved and changed very rapidly as data from each mission was returned. So we have three examples here. What are the origin of the Maria? I mean, you know, we didn't know what the origin of the Maria was. We didn't know what their ages were. We didn't know what the di diversity was. We didn't know any of this stuff. We learned it from Apollo 11 to 17. What's the lunar chronology in history? Is the moon young? Is the moon old? Did it form hot? Did it form cold? Uh, we knew none of this, OK? What's the range of ages on the surface? And the nature and role of impact basins. Actually, we didn't even know there were impact basins, OK? We just knew there were huge holes in the ground. Some people thought there were collapsed, maybe volcanoes, et cetera. We didn't know any of this stuff. So each time we flew a mission, we had to analyze the data really quickly, talk to the astronauts, get this information back into the next training cycle as well as the next site selection cycle. It was an incredibly iterative process. And that's really important for the future. OK. so. First of all, the Apollo shown here in blue. Look at the side screen here. It'll be much more obvious. And Luna 16, whoa, 16, 20, and 24, the Soviet lunar sample return missions. Let's start with Apollo 11. It landed in Mare Tranquilitatis for a variety of reasons. Smooth, but one of the Mare that we thought was one of the older because of the crater size density. Set up experimental stations. Uh, did a lot of really important things on the surface. And of course, were able to deploy instruments as well as visit craters like West Crater here. And this is the Apollo 11 traverses to scale of a baseball diamond. Uh, for those of our European colleagues and most people who watch the World Cup, you know, here's Neil coming over here and kicking in a goal for sure, uh, right at the edge of the uh, area here. And, and, you know, so it's not a lot of area. Actually, it's a lot of area when you think about it, but, but not what could, was to come. So we learned the ages of the surface of the Mari deposits. We, that was the beginning of the calibration. We wanted to go to Apollo 12, which was over here, which spectrally looked different. And so the other thing that happened with Apollo 12, that was where Surveyor 3 landed. Very wise engineers said, look, we actually, while we were on the moon, we didn't know where Apollo 11 landed, OK? All, throughout the whole thing in mission control, we didn't know where they were, OK? We knew they were on the moon. That was pretty clear, OK? But exactly where, because Neil, when he pitched over, oh, Jesus, look at all these boulders. So he's, he probably didn't say that. But anyway, he, you know, he's flying a thing, and we, you know, we didn't know how far, et cetera, and finally landed about, I think, 11 kilometers downrange. OK, so the engineer said, look, 
particularly Bob Gilruth, the director, said, look, we, we need to develop 10-point landing so we can go uh, to where we want to go so the scientists can get exactly what they want. Now, this is amazing, the second mission. And indeed, it was dedicated to landing next to the Surveyor 3 spacecraft in the area that we wanted to go anyway. And that was a big thing with the engineers. Can we do it? Can we do it? And imagine when they pitched over and they saw the Surveyor 3 spacecraft. And in fact, Apollo 12 uh, was just amazing, OK, in that it not only did that, it collected a variety of different rocks, young basalts, 3.2 billion years, et cetera, some material from Copernicus, et cetera, uh, and in fact, was able to uh, get over here to Surveyor Crater and indeed uh, sample the spacecraft, exactly, and, and take a look at what the damages were over the space and time that it had been there. So this was an incredibly successful mission, but the best part of it was it opened up the moon to wherever we wanted to go. So we were able to go to the ejecta deposits from the Apollo, from the Imbrium Basin, okay, the Apollo 14 site was the next targeted area, so we could land in the highlands, in these grooves from the radial ejecta deposits, and see, in fact, what was going on there. What was the age? What were the breaches like? What, you know, what, what were their breaches? Whatever. And so that was a target for Apollo 13, and everybody knows the Apollo 13 story. We were really lucky uh, that we were able to get them back. And this same um, uh, uh, landing site was kept for Apollo 14 uh, at this uh, uh, Framora formation, and that successfully landed. Not only did it land, and there were two periods of EVA, which in fact the astronauts had a mobile equipment transporter to carry this stuff on these long traverses, okay? A development of mobility capability. And uh, Shepard and um, uh, the other guy, uh, Ed Mitchell, I'm sorry, Ed Mitchell, I apologize. It's late in the day. Okay, we're, we really returned some great data here and we learned so much about what was going on. It extended these travers up to the edge of Cone Crater here and in fact used the mobile equipment transporter really well. Okay, so that opened up the question, what's at the edge of the Imbrium Basin? What's going on there in terms of the ejecta, et cetera? And we found, indeed, the target would be something. The big question was, were the Mari formed from the impact basins themselves? How deep did these basins excavate? So Apollo 15 was chosen right in the Avenine Mountains, uh, and a car. Let's put a car on the moon. What the hey, you know? And, you know, this is not trivial. This decision was made before Apollo 11, okay? So the engineers were already thinking about how to optimize. So this enabled three periods of EVA, plus a stand-up EVA that Dave Scott did to actually get a view of what the traverse area looked like. And it went for over 20 kilometers on the lunar surface. Three periods of EVA here, got to the Senuous Rill, got to the edge of the Apennine Mountains, uh, got 500 millimeter shots across 15415, the Genesis rock, the oldest crustal rock that had been obtained to date. This then factored into our understanding and, and then influenced our thinking for the next landing sites. And then surprises, the green glass. This is the glass that Alberto Salad Brown analyzed 40-some years later and found the water in, okay? So Apollo, it keeps on giving, okay? Trust me on that one. Okay, so here we have this then. And then, of course, Apollo 16. What, what are these planes units in the, in the highlands, okay? Are they volcanism? Are they light planes units? Are they volcanic activity associated with uh, pre mare volcanism? Uh, what's going on here, okay? So we thought it was volcanic activity. John Young and Charlie Duke went there uh, on Apollo 16, a really great mission. Uh, what did they find when they got out of the lunar module? Breaches. Breaches. And more breaches. In fact, we used to go into mission control late at night, um, and they let us talk to the astronauts from time to time on our way back. And so we talked to John and Charlie, and uh, said, John, hey, he said, hey, he said, I don't know if you know him, he's kind of like a country guy, wonderful man. He said, hey, you know, you geologists are going to have to go back to the drawing board or wherever it is you go, you know, <laughs> because it's not volcanic, it's impact. We learned so much from this, it was totally amazing, okay? So this is a great mission, all the way up down to uh, the mountains on both ends, the big craters, et cetera, and we learned a huge amount about the highlands, the impact basins, and the morphology, et cetera. And here's John, a meter off the surface uh, uh, in his Navy salute. Okay, Apollo 17, and we then wanted to go to one of the other basins, okay? Also, this dark mantling deposit. What was this all about, okay? Could it be really young? Some people thought that, in fact, it was the youngest volcanism on the moon, and so the impact basin here was targeted uh, for the Apollo 17 site. The rover was obviously also used there, and this mission continued to culminate, continued to culminate, that doesn't work, continued to accrete more and more scientific capability uh, as we go along here, and you can see here that, uh, in fact, Jack Schmidt discovered the orange soil. He did one of these boulders, uh, it analyzed one of these boulders as a geologist. Amazing documentation, you know. If you're lucky enough to work with one of these things and go back to the descriptions and documentation, you're totally stunning. 
you can see the size of the boulder relative to the lunar rover vehicle. The orange glass didn't turn out to be young. It was like 3.7 billion, back to the drawing board again, but that's why you explore. Okay, huge, this is a scale here of a couple kilometers. Huge traverses, over 20 some kilometers, uh, and they're they absolutely wonderful, okay? So Cernan and Schmidt just did a superb job here. Uh, unfortunately, it was the last Apollo mission that was flown. Uh, but let me just take a minute here to talk about science and engineering synergism, okay? Because this leads into the latter, uh, the, the, the final points that I want to make here. First, how do we get to land in this area? If you take a look at the morphology here, you'll see that, in fact, this valley is surrounded by these mountains. Some of the engineers were calling it the Box Canyon. And for any of you who live in Texas and follow Westerns, you know that's not a place you want to get into. It's a trap, okay? So uh, the, the landing ellipse did not fit into this canyon. It was too big, okay? So, but a guy named Phil Schaffer in Flight Operations Directorate, we met with him, God, all day, one day. It was like incredible. No, it doesn't fit. No, we can't do it. No, it can't. No, it's just not going to, we can't go there. Phil, had we taken him into the field with us, Phil said, okay, look, people, I know each of you who are putting input into the final pad, a final um, ellipse here, has their pad. What's a pad? Pad is like, okay, I, I think I got it. Let's see, we've never done this before, so I think it's going to be this number, but I better put 10% in there just to be sure, okay? Well, everybody was putting 10% in, okay? So Phil knew that, uh, in fact, there were a lot of 10% adding up there, so he said, he was a rather large guy, he said, we're having a meeting at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, and we're going to decide that the landing ellipse fits in the Taurus Metro Valley. <laughs> and so, whoa, so go back and scrub your pads, damn it. And they did. And we came back the next morning, son of a gun. It just perfectly fit in there. And that's, that's why we went to Apollo 70. That's science and engineering synergism, okay? Now, also, look what was going on here. We've talked about that. Look at all this. It's wonderful LROC images. Mark Robinson ought to get a gold, several gold medals for that experiment and that mission, et cetera. This is just amazing. Look at all the activity around here. What's Jack Schmidt doing here? It looks like he's detonating something. Well, there, was, there were explosive dead. That's a gravimeter, a traverse gravimeter, a traverse gravimeter. There was all kinds of scientific experiments. Jack Schmidt and others on the late Apollo missions took a rake. Why did they take a rake to the moon? It's like, hey, Houston, we want to have a rake here. You want to bungee it on the bungee cord it on the side of the lunar module? Had it, a rake? What? Well, the point was, in the early missions, you got a lot of soil back with only a few large fragments. So we sat back and said, geez, we've got to really improve this. So we designed this kind of rake. OK, you just rake. You pick up all these fragments in here, and you optimize the rocks that are coming in from elsewhere, not just tiny little grains. OK, get the soil too, but you got. So this was something that was put on in the middle part of the Apollo missions, and it was really incredible. Now, just take a look at this. I mentioned science on the moon, science from the moon, science at the moon, science and engineering synergism. Take a look at these things. You probably can't see them, but let me read them to you. Gravimeter, heat flow experiment. ALSEP Central Station, Geophone Rock, okay, LEAN, that's the Lunar Ejectant Meteorite Experiment, there's the RTG, uh, there's another experiment here, there's a surface electro properties measurement, the Grimeter in action here, tons of things, and in orbit we had, in fact, a, a radar instrument that was penetrating down and in, uh, into the subsurface, okay, lots of different things, plus the rest of the command module, the uh, SIM bay, the scientific instrument module bay, was filled with experiments, cameras, other kinds of experiments, sub-satellites being dumped out, et cetera. An amazing thing. Probably 50% of the people in this room are not even aware of that. Incredible science was going on throughout this, okay? Now, if you take a look at the end of the Apollo program, this is uh, essentially taking the Apollo missions and putting them at the center of a, 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 of a bullseye here, if you will, and one of them here is a couple of them are taken and done end to end. But the point is, look, you're getting out to 11 kilometers or so. Meantime, the Soviets, okay, are doing Lunokhod. Lunokhod got out to 13 kilometers and, uh, you know, amazing robotic capability. There's a lesson here. We should be doing this in the future. This is interpolation and extrapolation. Uh, so this is really amazing. Only recently did, um, did uh, uh, opportunity exceed the record of the Lunokhod <laughs> on Mars, of course. But, I mean, that's 45 years later, you know, we finally got around to exceeding that. I mean, very impressive engineering, okay? So we learned so much from the moon. And I'm not going to read these off, but remember, we knew nothing about the moon. And here, each of these things, and this will be in the online uh, if you want to go look at it. But, you know, Apollo provided fundamental knowledge and a rich legacy for future generations about the nature of the moon and how we could optimize this for other planetary bodies and understand the fundamental aspects of the science, okay? 
But that wasn't all. Okay, I mentioned to you that Apollo had come to an end, but there were lots of plans after that. Okay, political variety of reasons. Nixon didn't want to have an accident on his watch, and so on. Lots of political reasons. Buy me a beer, and I'll tell you as much as I know about them. Kind of interesting. Okay, but here's the fact: I worked on Apollo 20, 1920, 21, and actually 22, but nobody knows about that one. It's not a secret. Nobody knows about it. That's all. So anyway, so what was I doing for these missions? We were doing dual mode roving vehicles, okay? Interpolation and extrapolation. This was an improvement on the rover that was being designed and built, okay? Uh, and so what would this do? Once you got through the mission and came back to the Earth, you set this thing off to the next landing site. If the next landing site was too far away, you set it off to interpolate and extrapolate while, uh, in fact, uh, after the astronauts had gone. So, you know, <laughs> This is really amazing, okay? And it would have happened uh, had these missions continued. I also worked on, this is just almost like hard to believe, but lunar flying units, okay? Now, literally, I designed traverses where astronauts would get on one of these things and fly up to the top of the mountains, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, <laughs> one of the things you can see from this, if you just look closely, figure 13, hmm, okay. General arrangement, hmm, yes. Well, there were a few little bugs in this thing, okay? The jetpack was considered, uh, you know, the lunar uh, landing vehicle thing kept, you know, Neil Armstrong had to bail out of that at like 50 feet practically and, you know, like a... So these kind of things were not really thought uh, too well of. And, you know, sort of like in the beginning, like about Apollo 12, we stopped working on these. But they really wanted to do them, okay? The capability got developed. It's really important. Science and engineering synergism, uh, the, the engineers were doing their best to try to do this sort of thing. So let's talk about specific goals. We know what we've done here. Incredible, okay. We can do that again. We've done it, okay. So we can do it again, okay. So specific goals for human robotic partnerships on the moon. You know, we have so much information. You heard from Mark Robinson. You heard from Paul Spudis. You heard from Clive Neal and many, many others who talked about the amazing information we have uh, about the moon. So, you know, there's lots of things to do. We can go back and we can do things we can never do on other planetary bodies that feed forward to understanding those planetary bodies. So take a look at the grail data. It's like putting the moon under uh, an x-ray machine. I mean, we now want to know what the subsurface structure looks like. And so I'm just going to go over a couple of points here to point out that the moon, as an example, post-Apollo, we didn't do it on Apollo. We haven't been there and done that. We've been there, we've done a lot of things, and it's opened up new vistas for exploration. The moon formed from the impact of a Mars-sized object into early Earth. We learned that from Apollo, basically. Okay, so now we're thinking, how did this whole thing work? Huge amounts of new information about planetary accretion and the early history of the Earth are coming out of this uh, from the discoveries about devolatization, the lack of it, and how that's working, et cetera. We heard some talks about that. Lots of things going on that are critically important there. The early moon was characterized by a global-scale magma ocean. Well, we know the principles and the basics, okay, but new information is coming along all the time. This makes it very different than the Earth, okay, in terms of crustal formation and evolution. It's kind of like a frame of reference for other planetary bodies and possibly early Earth. They don't all work the same way, but the principle is huge amounts of impact energy can cause global melting. We also know that that has also affected the megaregolith, the outer part of the crust. We know there's crustal structure. We have new data from Grail that suggests it's more fractured than we thought. We, we need to go back and compare the remote sensing data to, um, to crustal stratigraphy like Carly Peters has done. Uh, and because we need to understand exactly how that magma ocean worked, okay? And we have it within our ability to do that. We're learning a lot, but future human and robotic exploration can really do that. The moon initially differentiated in chemical layers, including crust and mantle, that set the stage for further evolution. So what's the mantle look like? We've had some great discussions about this, online and offline, so to speak. And, you know, it, you know where is the mantle material in the, uh, you know, perhaps it's the olivine that we see, perhaps maybe... It's not as olivine-rich as we might think, okay? Why don't the big basins excavate this stuff? Are they melting at all? What's happening here? We don't really know. A critical, critical aspect of these chemical layers. We also don't understand this Procolarum creep terrain. What is the origin of this creep-rich area, okay? How does it fit into early history? What's going on? A lot of ideas, but in fact, uh, it's not known. Chemical and thermal nature of these stratified layers may have led to net negative buoyancy, large-scale overturn, and significant vertical mixing. In a nutshell, I call this the aftermath, okay? From the early accretion and differentiation, it was unstable due to a variety of reasons, thermal and uh, chemical buoyancy differences, and so it collapsed. This is probably what set off the Mare basalt volcanism, but how did that work? What was it? Was it global? Was it not global? How is 
the Procolarum creep terrain, how does it fit into that? We don't know. We don't know. Okay, we've got a lot of ideas, but we don't know. That's a major outstanding question that can be addressed. And then the last two, the moon is a template for the record of the distribution history of impactors in the solar system. We heard from Bill Botke, like, whoa, maybe the ejecta from the impact it formed came back and formed South Pole Aiken. I mean, you know, wow. <laughs> I need to think about that, okay? Lots of new things coming along here as well. We also know that volatiles play a more important role in lunar evolution than previously thought, okay? So these are critical. We heard lots of discussions about this. And as Paul Spood has said, this could be the future. If these things, in fact, are in abundances that we need to, that we can take advantage of, this could be the future of really making uh, exploration of space a reality. Okay, so let me just finish with a couple of examples here, okay? Science and engineering synergism. You heard what I told you about Apollo, how critical it was and how important it was, and, and actually how exciting it was. I learned so much from these engineers, like amazing, okay? If you think about this, let me, let me just uh, treat a couple of these. The, the MIT Brown Halo mission, okay? So what we're trying to do here is do science and engineering synergism from the bottom up, okay? Not somebody says we're going to this place here and do it, okay? Not the top down. It's like, okay, how do we get together, get the students together so they're born and bred with science and engineering synergism? Well, we worked with MIT in our NLSI Brown MIT effort, and we've had some real fun doing this. What did we decide to do? We really wanted to uh, resume human exploration of the moon. So what approach and what architecture? Constellation was canceled. Uh, so what do we do? Okay, you know, we don't have all that money anymore. So what's going on? How do we do this? So we started with a science and engineering synergism, Brown students and MIT students meeting together to try to develop the ideas about this, okay? Well, what did we do first? We determined the science requirements at the get-go, not, okay, here's an architecture, what can you do with it? It's like, hey, engineers, listen to us. We want, of course, notice the number of mores on this, okay? We want full lunar access, poles, near side, far side, longer stay time, 7 to 14 days, more payload, to and from the moon, more mobility, more flexibility with robots, human robotic partnerships, gimme, 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 okay? Well, you'd think, you know, they just kind of slap us down and say, let's get real. They were so intrigued, you know, they were really excited about this challenge. So what do we do then? We said, okay, let's optimize the engineering for science. There's a concept, okay. Engage the engineers from the beginning. We said, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. Don't give me any of these, like, like here's the goals we want. Let's just do it, okay. So let's, you know, we're scratching our head. How do we approach this? Huh, let's start with something that worked. Huh, let's just, oh, wait a minute, Apollo, we did it. There's a concept. Let's start with something that actually worked, not something you know built out of from the top down. You know, it's been 45 years since we actually did that. There must be a lot of technological developments here, folks. Okay, the answer is, of course there are. Okay, so let's take the basic Apollo architecture, see what we can do with increased capabilities and technology and materials since Apollo 45 years ago or so. I lose track. Okay, and what comes out of that, okay? And by the way, we get some very bright scientists and engineers together at MIT and Brown and, you know, see what we can do. Okay, so the bottom line was that we, in fact, it's exactly what we did. We started with what works, Luna and Apollo, and we used 40 years of technology experience, and we really worked here to train the next generation, develop a bottom-ups approach, have scientists and engineers work together and work towards a legacy, that is, lasting results, not just flags and footprints, but echoing what our speakers have said, we need something that's sustainable here, okay? So science and engineering synergism were one of the major goals of doing all this, okay? The first thing we did was we got some good teachers. You know, that, that's kind of important if you're going to lead something like this. So we got Dave Scott to come and be a, a visiting professor at Brown University. Uh, Dave, in fact, uh, you can see him in the lab on the moon and in the classroom here. He, he listened, he taught, uh, he helped the students, et cetera, uh, worked with the MIT students and so on. Here he is explaining on one of our walls uh, the, you know, the the nature of the Apollo 15 landing site and these incredible LROC images uh, from Mark Robinson. Uh, he also talked about his mission immensely. You know, what were the details? What was going on? How can we optimize this? What, do we, what will we do differently in the future? We also got MIT professor Jeff Hoffman, a five-time shuttle astronaut, a uh, professor of aeroastro there, uh, whose class, in fact, led the engineering effort. Amazing guy. You can see him here both uh, on Earth and in space. Um, and we started these kind of like conversations. We'd have meetings, Brown and, and MIT. Uh, we started out here, science via hopping. We wanted to look at new technology for robotic exploration as well. So Farah Alabe and Phil Cuno from MIT filled us in on what you can do with a new form of surface. We wanted to go to the bottom of the rail. Well, we couldn't do that on Apollo. 
but with hoppers you can do it. Totally amazing. We in parallel started outlining the scientific objectives of a revisit to the Apollo 15 area. And with these hoppers, it was amazing. You could design traverses that would go from the landing site down into there and do all kinds of experiments, OK? And it's amazing what's come about since 45 years. Plus, they had this thing that blew me away. Oh, yeah, we'll just put this into the trade space investigation modeling tool. Huh? You know? And uh, so, so and out pops planetary surface hoppers, OK? There's a lot of engineering that goes on in between these two things. But the fact of the matter is, they had these things really nailed down uh, for optimizing the science. And then they could even cost them out. Totally amazing. We learned so much from them, OK? Then we would go to design an Apollo 15 mission, uh, a revisit mission. So we said, look, it's been 45 years. What have we learned from Apollo, particularly at Apollo 15, that we would want to go back and address? So in fact, we had all kinds of things here. You can see Apollo 15 Power Classic glasses, Alberto Sol. What questions do you have now, Alberto? OK, lots of questions, OK? Uh, Tim Grove, an expert on Mari Basalts. Ben Weiss, expert on paleomagnetism, et cetera, et cetera, and all sorts of people here to put together these seminars and have these discussions to lead to the scientific goals and objectives of such a mission. Uh, this is Jeff Hoffman. We had a lot of meetings. They were really fun, OK? You'll see Coke bottles on the table here, but I've called out the ones that had all the beer in them because it doesn't look quite right. Nonetheless, that's what we did. Lots of great discussions with, uh, with the uh, science engineers. Sometimes we talked. Sometimes we thought. Here's Sasha Bazilewski, who gave us perspective on a Soviet program. And what did they come up with? Exactly what we wanted. Full lunar access, OK? <laughs> Just amazing. So this will be in the details. But basically, not using SLS. Glad to use SLS. But we don't need it, OK? We just need heavy lift launch vehicles of the kind that exists right now. Assemble an orbit. Go to the moon. They found an elliptical polar orbit capability that would actually get us full lunar access, OK? Amazing, OK? Then you go down to the moon, to, to the surface of the moon, and you do your traverses, OK? So when they took a look at this, you know, uh, partway through this, I got this email and said, Jim, we need to talk to you. We need to actually talk to you. Like, so I dug, out, dug under all the crap on my desk and found my telephone. And, um, and we, we talked, uh, and they said, we've got a problem here. We think we found out a way to get much more down mass, OK, which is what we want. We want to you know, take experiments down. We want to be able to bring rocks back. Said, but there's one thing. We, we're going to have to. We're going to have to descend. We're going to have to deorbit um, the the landing thing to, to save. Uh, you know, we're t taking this thing down. It's spent. We're going to deorbit it and get it down. And we can, we think we can get it far enough away from the landing site so it won't be a problem. I said, Well, how far is that? Well, you know, how far do you want it to be? I said, I want it to be close enough so that we can go look at the damn crater you're going to make. Okay. So they'd figured out a way to optimize us and created a scientific experiment which in this nominal architecture would produce a huge crater okay, that we could go look at. I mean, what more could you ask? Okay, A fresh crater right there to look at the excavation, blah, blah, blah. It was amazing. Okay, So this is just one example of this. Okay, So I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I just want to point out all the kinds of things here. You can look at this later. Increase down mass, bandwidth, sensors, guidance and navigation, power upgrades, life support, so on and so on. The bottom line is, and I'll just superpose the final analysis on here, look at this comparison. Okay. Uh, this is Altair and Con Constellation, Apollo Lunar Module. Look at the two options they have here for the HALO's lunar lander. Okay, payload mass. This is not fuel. This is payload mass. Okay, 2,300, 1,200 kilometers and two different uh, options here. 350 kilogram sample return. 350 kilogram sample return. Okay, or 700, okay. Three astronauts to the surface and either a seven or a 14 day mission. I mean, this is like amazing, okay. This is all done with upgraded Apollo architecture, new materials and a new kind of architecture that permits you to do this even with small, even with uh, existing launch vehicles, OK, not the SLS. But let me finish here by giving you a couple of other examples, because I really want to hit hard the science and engineering synergism. Well, we try to do this at every possible turn, to train the students and what they need to know to, in fact, be good citizens in this area and, and optimize not just the science, but the engineering as well, and develop these. So Brown CubeSat, Brown has a CubeSat team. Uh, which is it's a CubeSat that's under construction by Brown University undergraduates. And we work with the engineering group to work with them uh, to learn how to do missions. So I get a call from Rick Fleeter, the engineering professor. He's the father of small sats, actually. Uh, and he says, that we need to teach these students how to um, uh, essentially uh, uh, under do the, undertake their management. They're so excited about the spacecraft. So I said, well, let's have a management review board. And so I said to my students, OK, look, we're going to be a management review board. And of course, they said, what's a management review board? And the students there say, what's a management review board? And so we set up a management review board. Everybody learned what management 
is all about and how you got deadlines and all these other things. It's not just putting, you know, it's not just bending metal, it's doing all these other things as well. Imagine their surprise when I told them, oh, by the way, uh, there's two co-chairs for the Management Review Board, these, these wonderful students here at Brown and Engineering. Uh, one of them's Apollo 15 Commander Dave Scott, and uh, the other one is uh, Jenny Whitten, who just got her PhD uh, for Brown. And you know, it's kind of like intimidating. Oh my God, we're building a CubeSat, and a freaking commander of the Apollo 15 mission is going to be examining our management plan. It was great, okay? It was really great. But the point is, you know, you get to learn. Our, my students learn what management review is all about, so did they, and it was a really great situation. Hi, Jim. This is amazing. Now, we need to think to the future because um, there's so much going on. This is why Survey is so important. It brings together all these things, okay? So there is this thing called International Genetically Engineered Machine. It's a competition among college students to produce things uh, from genetic engineering that can, in our case, optimize space exploration. Many of you may never have heard of this. You need to learn about genetic engineering. It's a scary thought when you think about it, but there's so much, so much opportunity for space exploration. You have no idea. Trust me on this. Here at Ames, Dr. Lynn Rothschild is just down, the, down McCord, the other end of McCord here, through the gate on the right, and like they're doing amazing things. So late Monday, I went over there. We always go over there. They come to Brown. Uh, and so this is the Science and Engineering Synergism with iGEM, okay? So it's NASA Ames under Dr. Lynn Rothschild. Students from Brown University, Stanford, and Spelman College spend the summer, and they do these iGEM projects, and they place very favorably in the international competitions as well. Okay, so what they do is they work this. We talk to them about goals and objectives. Then they come to Brown before the competition. We go through a series of reviews, et cetera. They practice this thing, and it's just incredibly wonderful. Not only that, what they're trying to do is optimize upmass constraints uh, and human robotic partnerships. So, for example, if you want to go to Mars, um, you know, imagine the ability to take organisms with you that are hopefully benign. That's something you need to be careful about. But they can produce things. Like, for example, one project was bio bricks. Okay, you just shovel regolith into this pot, and it'll the organisms will make bricks for you. You know, so you don't have to carry the bricks. You don't have to carry a bunch of stuff. You just have to carry a bunch of. It's like yogurt. Okay, it just does its thing. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is they've been working on is biodegradable UAVs. This is unbelievable. I mean, to me, it was unbelievable. So I heard about this money. I went over there, talked to them. What an incredible group. They're just amazing. It's right here at Ames, okay? They're just doing all these really important things. They were showing me these biodegradable films um, that they're using in cellulose, et cetera, that, that are produced by these organisms. And they're trying to make these so that they don't contaminate the environment. We talked about how we use these in volcanoes and Antarctica and Mars, and, and just amazing, okay? The final one is the future here with astronauts, okay? So we actually have two classes. What's Dos Equis and 21 here? Chumps and eight balls. This is the two most recent astronaut classes, okay? The chumps uh, are the class 20 and 21 is the eight balls. Each preceding class gives them their new name. This is a resource. These people are stunningly amazing. You can imagine. I mean, think about what it takes to become an astronaut. The competition is huge. and the So I still work in astronaut training. It's wonderful. A uh, number of people here, David Kring has also participated, Jake Bleacher, et cetera, just took some of these teams into the field. Great stuff, okay? We need to connect with these people uh, in addition. Uh, here's the Dos Equis, the 21st class. Uh, this person has flown, and this person is currently in orbit, okay? So uh, we had them come up to Brown. They came up in their T-38s, you know, they, they kind of a tough schedule. They came up on a weekend. Why not? We had a blast, okay? Uh, well, of course, there was beer involved because they're Dos Equis, but... Uh, in any case, Jerry Griffin, Apollo 15 cl flight director, and Dave Scott were there. We talked all about future exploration and all these kinds of things. Reed is now uh, in orbit in the space station. Here he is uh, working in that, that thing that's more realistic view, uh, Klaus of, of the interior of the uh, station, if you will. Uh, lots of wires and things like that, doing some experiments. And here he is with a yo-yo, okay, performing some kind of scientific experiment. I'll, I'll wait to hear the results of that one. And this class is just amazing, okay? The, the, these are the eight balls. They're eight uh, men and women who are tops in their field. I mean, these people are so, they're scientists, they're engineers, they're, they're military pilots, et cetera. This woman here, Ann McLean, she's flown 212 combat helicopter missions in Iraq. And I have to tell you that I would follow that woman to Mars if she were commander, no problem, no problem at all. I mean, I'd, I'd be relieved to have her be the commander of a mission that I participated in. All of these people are stunning, and we need to engage them, and we will in future meetings, et cetera, okay? By the way, there's uh, Jessica Meyer is a biology graduate from Brown. Just put a little plug there. 
So <laughs> let's just finish here, and I'm sorry if I'm running over a bit here, with the lessons uh, from all this, OK? There are a few, I hope. And indeed, when we take a look at this, we all would agree that the horizon goal is Mars. OK, the horizon goal. That's what NASA calls it, and I think that's the right way to go. Because we're not there yet. We're not going to get there in the nearest future. But it is the horizon goal. There's a profusion of scientific goals for human exploration on the way, and there's huge amounts of robotic exploration in the process. Not just precursors, partnerships, but also like with the dual mode rover, interpolation and extrapolation. I mean, yeah, there's just so many things to do. We can use the Apollo model and then press on from there, OK? I mean, there's new things to do, et cetera. We are not crows. What does that mean? Well, when I was a kid, you know, I grew up partly in Virginia and um, my family, and they, they, you know, you'd see this old guy say, well, how far is it to Leesburg? He said, well, you know, it's about eight miles as the crow flies. And I, you know, that, I never saw a crow fly very straight, but I kind of got the picture. So, so when we're going to Mars, here's the thing to think about. You know, you take out your iPhone, you kind of, you know, punch up your Google Maps app, and you kind of like, okay, like, so, okay, punch in Mars, and whoa, 225 million kilometers, whoa, that's going to take a while. And so, you know, you sort of like, okay, what's the best way to go here? You kind of do, do, okay. Maximize use of freeways. That's not going to work, okay. <laughs> and you feel, oh, here's one. Take the scenic route, okay? You know, that's the way to go, okay? You want to take the scenic route here, because, in fact, What's going on here? The pathway to Mars is not actually yet determined. And what we will find is that there's a better than even chance that we'll be going back to the moon big time, OK? With humans, boots on the surface, no question, OK? It's a long way to Mars, a long way to Mars. It is a horizon goal. Asteroid, uh, the arm mission, you know, that could be really great. That could be a major step in a direction that would be really helpful to understand a lot about how humans work. Uh, and how they can do these types of things, OK? I think we need to work together with the NASA uh, to optimize what can be done from that, but recognize that, you know, despite the short term, Mars is not on the agenda. Of course they're going to say that, OK? They have to say that. But let's be realistic. Every Apollo astronaut that I know says, we are not going to Mars without going back to the moon. You just can't do that. You can't do You have no idea. They say, you know, we made going to the moon look too easy. It is really hard, uh, and in fact, uh, Mars is not a small delta. It's a huge delta, OK? And so we're not going to get there right away. I know that's disappointing to many of you, but we're going to get there, no question. But the point is, it's going to be a nonlinear path, OK? It will not happen in one single administration. So there's lots of options. There's lots of opportunities. It's very hard to predict the future. Uh, and I could guarantee you, it won't be like you think it is. And in that context, there's a lot of opportunity uh, for the moon. And we should make it so, because it is so critical in the path to get to Mars, despite what programmatics and politics say. So the moon must not be ignored. If the US doesn't go, other nations are going. And that leads me to this next point, which is international leadership and engagement is essential. If the United States is in a declining mode in terms of leadership, some have argued that, then the best thing we can do is international cooperation, because maybe other nations will help us get there. Okay. Just have to explore, keep our options open, OK? I think we're in a position for leadership, but it's not going to be in this administration for the moon. We just need to plan ahead. OK, so let me finish up here. The importance of serving. <laughs> you know, I can't, you know, many of you may be saying, oh, this is not like AGU. Well, of course it's not like AGU. It's not supposed to be like AGU. You're supposed to be rubbing shoulders with these people you've never seen before, OK? And learn from them, engineers, scientists, people with great ideas about future missions, et cetera. And the, the thing about this is the core effort of science and engineering synergism. When we worked in Apollo, we had to create science and engineering synergism. The two major directorates in NASA are telling you that that's what they want to do. I mean, how hard is this? Okay, This is really great. We got them on board from the beginning. We just need to take advantage of it. Okay, Trust me on that one. It is so great to have this together and to have Servi as a nucleus to do this. So the point here is that science and engineering synergism is essential. From the beginning, like we're trying to do in classes at Brown, like we're trying to do at this conference, and like NASA is trying to do by funding this whole effort. Okay, So stick around for the Global Exploration Roadmap session, because that's the beginning. If you don't agree with ARM, Plan 1, Plan A, Plan B, tell them that. Talk to them about it. How can we optimize that? How can we put the moon back in the path? If you don't do that, it's your own damn fault, Okay, because we've got the opportunity. We're being asked by these two directorates to do that. Okay, Finally. Critical engagement of the next generation. This is a great segue into the meeting. It's going to happen after here. You know, if we're not doing this, we're really dumb. 
because uh, if we're not planning for the future as a country and, and a planet, um, you know, I, I would just end by saying, uh, Paul 16 Commander John Young always said in his inimitable way, wonderful man, just like the, the king of understatement, you know, Jim, single planet species don't survive. You know, think about that. <laughs> think about that. So there's good reasons for a lot of different components of, of uh, logic to actually press on, and survey is really a major step in the direction. I've never seen anything like this before since Apollo, and that's where we should be going in the future. So thank you very much, and uh, thanks for a great conference. <clears throat>
well, I don't know, you know, old so and so, this son of a bitch guy, and you know, people looked at him and said, "Can you stow that? We're launching next Tuesday." You know what I mean? It's like this kind of pettiness um, was just completely. Uh, well, it wasn't. It just didn't happen because you didn't have time to do that. Okay, and everybody respected everybody's opinion. Um, you know, you you. It was none of this like, oh, I don't know, I better not say anything. Everybody had their say. Everybody. The room did not adjourn until everybody had their say. It went around the table many, many times. And, and I think that's the spirit, human spirit, that actually if we can harness that to do anything, uh, you know, Apollo, I think, showed we can. So that's why I say today's question. If we have the money, uh, boy, the challenge. Wouldn't that be a great challenge? Okay. And, and I think we could do it as humans. So thanks. Okay, we're going to take one more question from somebody who neither works for me nor is married to me. So, Jake Bleacher. <laughs> All right. True. Yeah. Jake. Yeah, uh, Jake Bleacher, Goddard Space Flight Center, back here. Um, I have a quick question maybe just about what synergy really means to you, and I'll go from something that I deal with, which is the, the training part. Um, so if you ask Jack, he might insist well, it does in some places say that he thought there should be more autonomy to the astronauts in the, in the field. But then to hear you say, you, you thought they had plenty. And maybe an example would be the seatbelt rock. Mm -hmm. um, you could look at that and say that they didn't have enough autonomy to stop and pick up the rock and document it. Or you could look at that as an example of your, your uh, train them, trust them, and turn them loose mm -hmm. as within the rules, they knew how to bend them and get the job done. Yeah. So is, is, is synergy sure. as simple as making sure it's the rules are set between engineering and science, or is it also just trusting the people that within those guidelines you can still get the job done even if it's not totally by the rules? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's trust. The big, big one of those T's is trust them. Okay, so, so let me just mention here, because not everybody's familiar with the seatbelt assault. So, uh, on Apollo 15, on our way back to the lunar module at the end of one EVA, time was running out. Time means consumables, okay? It's not like, oh, well, you know, you got to stay on schedule. It's like you're going to die if you don't get back because your oxygen's, you know, running out, you know? Um, so um, Dave's on his way back with Jim, and, uh, and they'd already practiced this. Get this, they'd already practiced this. And Dave gives him the elbow. They see this big vesicular basalt just right out on our surface. And got to have that sucker, okay? Because we talked to them about the volatiles and blah, 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 blah. And so he, he stops his Houston, I have a trouble, I have a problem with my seatbelt. Oh, yeah, no, you, you better, oh, seatbelt, you could fall off. Okay, all right, take the time to get off and fix the seatbelt. So Dave got off, okay, went over, collected the rock, put it in his pocket, uh, got back on, as he said, one minute and 37 seconds. Okay, and, uh, and then um, to say Houston seatbelt's fine. Meanwhile, Jim, who's got in the elbow, is going, yeah, over there I see some craters and there's a lot, you know, it's giving the geo palaver there to distract them. And the point here is uh, not that they broke the rules to get away from harsh constraints from mission control, it's that they risked their ass, pardon me, they risked their lives, literally, to, um, you know, to actually do something important scientifically. And, you know, throughout the EVAs, it was the same way. You know, you, you talk today, like the green glass site. You know, he never would have found it, but he, he's, he, we had basic guidelines for what to do there, okay? There was ejecta, views of the real, all these kind of things. Uh, but those are guidelines. They're guidelines, okay? And they never felt like they had to do them. It was like, okay, you know, what's, oh, my God, look at that green stuff. Completely rewrote that station. Absolutely, okay? So I think that's the key. You know, we need to train them sufficiently that we can trust them and then turn them loose, okay? It isn't that, you know, we were in the back room during each of these missions, a geological back room. Sometimes we were needed, okay? On Apollo 15, again, buy me a beer, I'll tell you that story. But, you know, that, what, what do we do now? Because we're not sure about this, and we, went, we told them, okay, basically. Uh, we gave them our best estimate uh, and gave them a recommendation. But generally, they were on their own in, 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 the, in the most wonderful way. You should hear Dave Scott talk. You, if you heard his... Uh, Mazursky lecture last year at LPSC, he talked about being in the zone. He said he was on the moon. He was so excited about the geological exploration. He didn't even know he was in a spacesuit. I think I would have, you know, is that the Earth up there? Holy Jesus, you know. Uh, I think I would have been a little less uh, blasé than that, but he was so excited about doing that exploration. He didn't even know he was in a spacesuit. It's amazing. That's the kind of thing we need to develop. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you. I can tell by the looks on your faces you all enjoyed that as much as I did.
great talk. Okay, so now we're going to close what's been an absolutely wonderful Exploration Science Forum. I thank you all for being here with us as we did this. It would not have happened without the incredible hard work that's gone on for several weeks, months even, by the survey staff. I would like to ask them to please come down in front right now. Those that are still here, some are tucked away in little other places, but the ones that are here, please come down and just stand in front here and face the audience. I'm just going to read off their names. And uh, Ricky, I know you're back in the control room. Do you have the slides that I sent you that you can put up? OK, great. And then if, well, I, I don't know. There's, you can't see Ricky because he's in the room. <laughs> OK, but anyway, uh, first of all, Greg Schmidt, what are you doing sitting down? Stand up. <laughs> Brad, get up. Goodness gracious. <laughs> this is my other better half. <laughs> OK, so Greg Schmidt, our deputy director. And then in alphabetical order, I'm just going to read down this list. Jen Baer, our graphic designer, please wave your hand. OK. All the great artwork you've seen, anything you've enjoyed that way, the program, that's all Jen. Uh, OK, you don't have to clap after each one. Let's just do it at the end. OK, uh, Brad Bailey, our staff scientist. <laughs> Shirley Berthold, who is our chief of staff and also the LOC local organizing committee chair for this meeting. Fabulous job. Doris Dow, who is at headquarters already, she had to fly back. She is our headquarters liaison and also our associate director. Uh, Brian Day, in charge of outreach and citizen science. And how many of you got to see the LMMP demo during the week? Good. Oh, wonderful. Excellent work. OK, Ricky Guest, who's hiding in the black room back there, and uh, uh, he likes to stay behind the curtain. Uh, I'm on Dave. the camera. Oh, is that there? Oh, he's on the screen. Oh, great. There he is. OK, that's Ricky, uh, man behind the curtain, part of our tech staff. Uh, Yale Kovo, uh, is she here? No, she had to go home. OK, she was doing our web uh, interfaces. Uh, Joe Manafra, who is our tech lead. Joe, thank you. Uh, David Morrison, our senior scientist and expert on asteroids, and another one who's sitting down. We, uh, you're supposed to be up here. They don't listen to me. <laughs> Oh, no, OK, um, Maria Leas, who is our, uh, also in our tech team now and uh, our admin as well. So that's quite a number of jobs. Uh, Ashkan Nijad, is Ashkan here? OK, great. He's waving to you as well, another member of our tech staff. Teague Soderman, who is our tech writer. All the press releases and stories you see on the web, they come from, from Teague. Chris Wilson, who's probably on the screen as well, maybe? It's over here. OK, I know, know where you guys are. OK, uh, another part of our tech staff. Thank you very much. And uh, is Marco Bolt here? No, OK. He's an, we'll call him an honorary survey staff member. He's actually from the NASA Astrobiology Institute, and he served on our LOC this year. So let's all give them, let's give them a big round of applause, please. You guys, just, just have a seat, except for you. I want you to stay up here. OK, OK. Greg and I do everything together, and it wouldn't be right for me to close this out by myself. So we're going to do this together. If you don't mind, sure. we're just going to sure. uh, take turns with some of what I've written up. Mm -hmm. Just briefly, I wanted to mention our scientific organizing committee, Nancy Chabot and Dana Hurley. Would you please stand up if you're here? There's Dana. There's Dana. Is Nancy here? Nancy, Nancy. Nancy yeah. may have had to catch a flight back, so. OK, great. And uh, there are many people who were on the Scientific Organizing Committee. You can see their names up here as well. Uh, some are here in the room. If you're in the room and you were on the Scientific Organizing Committee, please stand up. I know Dan Britt is here. Derek Sears. Uh, I see Tobin. Tobin Monta. Great. Thank you so much. OK, great. And then this is from our focus groups. Would you like to read this? Oh, sure, okay. sure. So our uh, focus we, groups met. We got three reports. Back. Yeah, yeah. So we, we have three reports. The first one is from the uh, bombardment focus group. Um, they, uh, they had the third installment of their successful workshop on the uh, early solar system bombardment. Um, had, I should say, will have. Um, that's going to be February um, 4th through 6th, 2015 and at uh, LPI. It's already successful. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. The first two were, uh, were uh, pretty darn good. That's my fault. I messed up the way 
<laughs> it will be successful, right? <laughs> Um, they identified two topics for a future discussion that could potentially lend themselves to one-day-long one virtual seminars, and those two topics are uh, strengths of small near-Earth asteroids that strike Earth and delivery of volatiles by impacting near-Earth objects. So uh, thanks very much for that report. Um, I want to ask uh, at this time as well for uh, the other focus groups um, we're keenly interested. Exactly, yeah. For the ones that uh, that uh, we don't we aren't talking about here, um, we are keenly interested in uh, in summary reports. So uh, so please do uh, send those. So the second one is the uh, that I will talk about is the volatiles focus group. Um, I'll just read this out to you. The lunar volatiles focus group is expanding their scope to include volatiles in, on, and around other airless bodies in the inner solar system. Friends of lunar volatiles used as um, an email um, listserv, that's, that's their listserv, and, the, and uh, they have a monthly teleconference that they've had for, I think, over a year. They do have it up there, too, if you want to read it from there. Yeah, okay, to foster uh, dissemination of, of current research and information relevant to the uh, field. This has been a, quite an active focus group, and we certainly appreciate uh, what, they, uh, what they do. Um, Dana Hurley is the uh, chair, and so please contact her for, uh, for more information. Um, they did, by the way, um, help hold, held a uh, workshop without walls, um, and uh, they're in the process of uh, publishing a special uh, issue of Icarus. I should mention that uh, workshops without walls are something that we uh, at Survey are keenly interested in, uh, in sponsoring. We encourage the uh, community to suggest topics. This is a discussion topic that we have at our executive committee meeting, so please do um, bring these uh, topics to our attention. Finally, the SPA focus group um, is in the process of identifying additional data sets to add to the uh, excellent CLC database from Dave Krings, um, and both NLSI and Survey team. And uh, they also discussed what future small missions could do to advance our understanding of the uh, South Pole Aiken Basin and where future sample sites could and should be. Okay, great. Thank you for that. So, yes, so we would like to get reports from the other groups that met as well, and thank you all for participating in those. Uh, I'd like to just say briefly congratulations to all the award winners for ESF 2014, Paul Spudis, Michael Wargo posthumously, uh, Catherine Joy, and uh, Simone Marquis also our student poster winners uh, that you just met. Uh, please submit nominations for next year's award winners. You can submit them anytime, but if you want them to be considered during that calendar year, it needs to be in by March 31st or 15th. What did I say? March 31st. Okay, so, so just uh, um, for next year, just try and get it in by the end of March. Okay. Also, I want to mention that COSPAR uh, 2014, we have two awards that I know of. There may be more from this group as well, but the International Cooperation Medal is going to Carly Peters, and I wanted to give her a round of applause. <laughs> and then there's also an Outstanding Paper Award for Young Scientists, and this year it's going to Jessica Flayhout, I'm not sure I'm saying that right, and, uh, and the team that she worked with that came from the intern program led by David Kring uh, in 2010. So absolutely wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. job by those people. And you can see their names up on the screen as well. Okay, so these are just the last page of just some announcements. Do you want to say? Sure, okay. sure. So the, uh, we mentioned this morning that the Next Generation Lunar Scientists and Engineers is uh, meeting in, uh, immediate here immediately after uh, we close in this room. And uh, there's, uh, there's some very interesting ideas that they're going to put forth. Um, I had some discussions with uh, Laura Leacher and Noah Petro about this, so uh, I highly recommend that you uh, stay for this. Again, it's open to uh, people of, uh, of all ages. So, uh, um, and the panel discussion uh, during this is going to be uh, webcast for those who can attend. So please, uh, for those online right now, please stay uh, hooked up. Um, so let's see, the, uh, the other announcement, um, I also mentioned this uh, earlier, is uh, regarding AGU. 
So uh, please plan on another trip to uh, the Bay Area to, to support that. We, we both in our NLSI days and survey days have uh, supported sessions at this um, for several years now. We've gotten a very good response uh, to this, as a matter of fact, and uh, we hope this time we're not going to be last on, on Friday afternoon. <laughs> so I, I think it's our, our turn to be a little bit uh, earlier, even on Friday afternoon. We had wonderful attendance. Um, abstracts to this are due uh, by August uh, 6th, so uh, um, please, please do submit for that. So if any of you have any poll with the HEU committee that decides when our sessions are, please help us out. Um, and then the last announcement is just that we've already selected the dates for next year's Exploration Science Forum. They will be the exact same dates that we had them this year. That means they'll be on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, but the dates will be July 21st to the 23rd. Please mark your calendars and plan to be here. And thank you so much for coming this year. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.